There we go. Okay. Well, I'm happy to be here. Um, my connection to Chickwalk runs deep. I was a little barefoot snotty nose kid used to get to go into the, the back way to the kitchen to get a piece of pie once in a while, speaking of pie. Um, but uh, I wanna talk today, I was asked to talk about um, dad and I can't do that without talking about mom too. But I scanned 600 of my dad's slides a few years ago and many of them were labeled. And I was also of course able to talk to him because he just passed away about two and a half years ago. So um, not too long after that, uh, someone wrote a book that included um, information about dad and, and the historical society wanted to come to speak. And he said, no, no, I'm not a speaker. But I said, but you always like talking about your slides. So much of this was put together for a, a meeting several years ago. Um, and then I've added in, um, since they asked me to talk about the guard station and when I uh, first started working for the Forest Service, there's a little bit of that in there too. So um, I'm kind of embarrassed because I didn't know who exactly would be in the audience, but there are a few uh, superstars in the room here today. <laughs> So uh, my dad, uh, Rolf Sprine, and I, I also want to acknowledge that all of my siblings are here today with oh. me, as well as many nieces and nephews, and oh. so I'm happy to have to share this with them. Can everybody see the screen okay? So dad was in World War II. Um, he came to the North Shore with his father and two older brothers in um, the 1920s. Uh, when he was seven, and, he, and they got as far as Tofty in a very rutted road. It didn't even go, um, well, let's say I read the other day, Split Rock was 1924, I think, or so. So, you know, he came up partway up the shore, was struck with the country. So when he, when he got out of World War II, he returned to the Northwoods, where he really wanted to be. And he came up, um, came up the trail and uh, went on a canoe trip for a couple of weeks with three of his um, uh, buddies, three of his war buddies, and they did about a two-week trip uh, through Quetico in Canada, came back to um, end of the trail lodge where Al Hedstrom uh, was the owner, and Al said, well, what are you guys doing? And two of them had jobs, so they returned home, and my dad and his best friend stayed on and worked as fishing guides, so that's where he started up here, is at end of the trail lodge, and um, he, he worked as a fishing guide. He told me that the fish were everywhere. That was the easy part. Um, the tough part was that the maps were really bad back then. And I don't remember when Fisher Maps got started, but in the 40s, uh, you know, it was sort of back of the napkin kind of thing. You know, there were some maps, but they weren't widely available. So you had to get to know the country. And uh, when I came up here to work, um, he told me one time that you could put him in the middle of any lake up here at night and he'd be able to find his way back. So I aspired to do that by learning, <laughs> learning the um, silhouettes of the hills and the trees and the landmarks and things like that. And you can do it, it takes some time, but you had to know the country and you had to be able to keep the motor running because of course this was before the 1964 Wilderness Act. Motors were allowed everywhere. There were you know, lodges throughout the Boundary Waters. Um, and you had to be able to fry fish and make good camp coffee. <laughs> Those are kind of the critical things to be a guide. Um, I do fondly remember uh, dad uh, frying fish. That was sort of one of the only family meals that he cooked, always outdoors. And we often had uh, fried fish um, at the, uh, where we lived. And everybody in the neighborhood was invited to those fish fries. Some of the resorts that he worked at, um, he worked for Russell Blankenberg at Seagull Lodge and at the trail for Al Hedstrom, um, Windigo for Harry Brown, Jack Miles, uh, Andy Mayo at, at Wildwood, and then <coughs> incidental guiding at Chickwalk and Gunflint. Um, and then these are sort of a random set of slides. So they're not all super clear and then there may not be a logical flow to all of this, but it's just glimpses into the past. So uh, this is when the rec room was being added on to enter the trail lodge. Just kind of a cool picture up the channel. Um, and then my mom enters the picture. So dad was a guide, mom was working in Duluth. She's from Colorado. 
she was working in Duluth and saw an ad for Cabin Girl. That's what they were called back then. <laughs> and so she took the bus to Grand Marais and Al sent someone down to Grand Marais to pick her up and bring her up there. And so, uh, yeah, Al was the matchmaker. He told dad that G. Gale would really like to go fishing. And then <laughs> he told uh, my mom, Rolf would really like to take you fishing. And so they <laughs> did go fishing. My mom loved to fish. She fished in Colorado in the trout streams and such. Um, dating up here uh, maybe is different today. I don't know, but uh, they had a lot of evening socials, dances, and live music. And going up to um, the Canadian side to Jack's was one of the, the, the favorite places um, to go uh, for parties and evening socials. Um, and I just thought this was such a cool picture of the gondola. Yeah, I don't know where that is today, but isn't that cool? Wooden, you know, wood canvas boat. And then, you know, odd jobs in between uh, seasons, in between fishing. So here, um, Irv Benson had a sawmill going on say He was building his cabin. And so Rolf, the dad went up to help him. There's the finished, finished cabin, of course, Irv. Uh, many of you probably know he was quite a character, and uh, one of the only times I was inside that cabin, he had the egg beater on the drill press kind of thing. You know, every part of the cabin was a museum and, a, you know, all kinds of very interesting things. Some other uh, pictures just kind of around the lake. Um, this was on Seagull Lake. Wildwood Lodge was way down on the west side. Um, my parents actually tried to buy this. Uh, in the mid 50s. And I forget exactly what happened, but they, they felt like they, you know, someone sort of bought it out from under them. So they didn't get it. And, you know, lucky they didn't because then with the 64 Wilderness Act, they would have had to move it out, et cetera. And they ended up with Way of the Wilderness instead, but beautiful lodge. And of course that became, I see if I get this right, the history buffs in here it became uh, Sea Island Lodge, right? Mm -hmm. Am I right? Wow, yep. And uh, now just recently sold um, as a private cabin. <coughs> and this was the totem pole in front of the lodge. I don't know where that might be today. Maybe it's completely, uh, completely gone. But I thought that was interesting. And then you know, water was so important up here. Everyone traveled by water, and so. <laughs> when you guys were building the boathouse and I ran across all these boathouse pictures. So I just had to include them because that's where it all happened. People travel by water, you lived on the land, but the interaction happened, you know, between, um, you know, between the land and the, and the water. So some different boat, boathouses, Blomberg's on Seagull, um, Wendigo Lodge on Seagull owned by Harry Brown. Here's uh, the brown kids at their boathouse. You can see the wooden canoes and boats there. Um, and here's dad adding a new ramp onto the Windigo boathouse. Wildwood Lodge's boathouse. I don't know why there's all these slides of boathouses, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's kind of fun. And then I love this picture, um, May Mayos and Blomberg's out for a ride and they've got those uh, canvas <laughs> folding chairs, um, you know, that were popular back in the 50s and 60s. And I think there's a rocking chair in there. Anyway, su Sunday afternoon ride. Um, canoe trips, uh, this is down on Gish. And then we'll talk a little bit about dad's cabin. So after the war, uh, he was he want he wanted to put down roots up here and so he found this cabin it was owned by a couple of guys that did not come back from the war i don't know why but this was down on seagull about four miles um, in front of the little bog uh, in back of seagull island maybe they're all called that but uh, <laughs> when jim uh, gives his map presentation you can all find it on the map i don't have a slide of where if you notice on the left there's a wood canvas canoe and that's the one that's in the boat shed the canoe came with a cabin it was bought in 1941 by these two guys and shipped to Duluth from Old Town so that's on loan to Chickwack for five years and was just installed about a month ago or so 
I don't have many pictures of the inside of the cabin. It was a beautiful log cabin. I got to spend quite a bit of time there when I was young. It was removed after the 1964 Wilderness Act, sat in our yard for about 10 years in a pile of logs, and then Craig Rantala bought it, and it's on Dull Lake, on the non-roaded side of Dull Lake. Uh, this uh, is looking out towards what we always called Seagull Rock. There's always a ton of seagulls on it. And then we had a little stone fireplace there along the water. You can still find that. Um, there's a lot of brush there. Uh, Oler was often with our family. Um, these aren't us kids. I was, these are probably the brown kids. So this is before my time, but. And then a picture of the cabin in the winter. And, and then, you know, that question, what do you guys do up here in the winter? Right? <laughs> like people just can't imagine, right? So there is more pictures in dad's slide collection of winter things than there were summer things and maybe they had more time but you know go for a dog sled ride so this is mom with me on the sled this i think is in front of uh end of the trail lodge go ice fishing uh freddie schmidt my parents actually lived in tacknight harbor and worked for erie down there for about a year before they uh bought land up here and i'll talk more about that later but Fred Schmidt and dad were longtime friends, went on many canoe trips uh, together, and they were connected to that whole Taconite Harbor um, group. Then Taconite Harbor doesn't exist anymore. That's only a part of our history. It's, you, you can drive down there, it's just brush now. Uh, yeah, enter the Winter Trout Derby. These were really popular. We went every year. Um, I don't know, do they still go on? One. Winter Trout Derby? Yeah. yeah. Those are always a lot of fun. I love this picture. <laughs> the box is dog food. So they're hauling their own food. Everyone used canned dog food back then, but um, Marion and Ben Ferrier, friends of the family, they had a they had a, a, a an island on Sag or Ferry, I think it's still called Ferrier's Island. And this was labeled first snowmobile on Sag, 1962. Now I've heard that refuted, so I don't know really what all the rest of the facts are, but it was it was on the, it was labeled on the slide that way. So uh, I think it was a great picture of um, Ben and Marion. Ben passed away when I was fairly young, but Marion I knew all my life and the personal canoe that I use, I um, bought from her when she was um, leaving, uh, leaving SAG. Yeah, they came to um, enter the trail to pick up their mail, right? Everyone from the Canadian side and those still living in the Boundary Waters. They had a life estate, so they were allowed to live in their cabin till the end of their lives, um, even after the Wilderness Act. Uh, they came down to the end of the trail to get their mail instead of coming through Canada. And this is an earlier photo, but how about go snowshoeing in the winter? Yeah, notice he's got the long pole in case you go through the ice. Yeah, he was quite a character, I understand. I didn't know him, but. Put up the Christmas decorations. This is one of my favorite pictures of the Chickwalk Hill. You can't really even see that hill now. It's all grown up. But um, Ralph would put these up. And of course, you know, just like in town, when you drive around to look at the Christmas decorations, we'd always go see those at night and in the light. Uh, you go for a drive on the lake. Uh, this is my <laughs> uncle, Dave Scrine, down at the cabin. So of course the ice gets a certain thickness and you could drive on it and it gave you great freedom to go all over. Um, and then uh, how about the long winters just invent something, right? So <laughs> Frank Powell, I guess this was his airboat. I also know Willard Waters built something of a similar nature and it was really to bridge that gap in the spring and fall, spring breakup, you know, you're not, are you gonna go through the ice or do you get the canoe out or the boat? Same thing in the fall, you know, so there's a couple of weeks in there that are kind of iffy. I think this was to solve that problem of being safe. Um, I, I don't know that there's any around today, so I don't know if it was really the solution or not. And I, I understand they were extremely loud. Go for a drive to go to town. I know my parents spent at least one winter up here year round and they went to town once. In the, in the winter. So there's the Gunflint Pines. They look a little different today, but always picturesque and still picturesque today. 
And then here's Irv with the dog team. Love this photo. He's got a Duluth pack on the sled there. They were coming down to get the mail also. And then I know this is blurry, but this was labeled, uh, you know, Irv's taken his first uh, snowmobile out of the crate, 1965. Mm -hmm. Look how it just looks like a little boxy thing, pretty small. But um, yeah, I think Irv told dad something like, yeah, I don't have to feed it. <laughs> <laughs> so he was all for new, new thing, new inventions. So sledding in the winter, Lee and Cheryl Hedstrom sledding. I know Cheryl still comes up here and they're actually back in oh the room right there. oh my gosh did you know you were gonna be on i know it's a little blurry but i love this picture yeah mom carrying water this was at the end of the trail but when we lived um at way of the wilderness in the winter of course you had to carry the water too there was no running water and then I like this series, this was before my time, but those of you who uh, know about putting up ice, I, there's only a few pictures here, but I love this. So they're out sawing the ice. You gotta wait till it's a certain thickness and then cut it up and it floats up in the, in the lake surface. And then if, it's kind of hard to see, but they've got a slide up into the ice house and then check out where that truck is. And then you can see here, they're using the mechanical advantage of just Driving the truck backwards, ice goes right up into the ice house. And so my brother, Stuart, probably remembers us sneaking into Cliff Waters ice house when we were kids. It was not allowed. It was a great danger, you know, spanking type danger that if you went in there, but the sawdust was wet and cool. And on a hot day, there was nothing better than being in the ice house. And the ice, you know, it stayed all summer. He sold it in big blocks at the store. Go for a picnic in the winter. Well, people don't do this quite the same today because here they've cut boughs and put them over the snow and built a fire. So there's Tempest Benson, Marion and Ben Ferrier. I think maybe Minerva, I'm not sure. And then my mom, Gail, dad wasn't on this trip, but mom remembers these spring, late, late winter, early spring uh, picnics was a favorite time. And Jim, we were talking about this slide earlier. Uh, dad had a contract to plow the winter portage on SAG because you could drive to Canada then on the ice, but not through the narrows. So he had to go on land there. And so he was really mad at the Forest Service because they wouldn't let him cut a tree here. He had to <laughs> snake it through those two trees. And uh, you can't see him, but it's actually uh, dad and another guy up in the bed of the truck in the back. And then I think I maybe changed the order of these, but uh, part, of, part of this trip was moving um, logs and lumber from one place. So they, they moved, um, oh, let's see, I think I had it on this slide, Ode Walker's cabin from SAG to Wilderness Canoe Base in, this, in the back of this truck over, over time. And then here's a picture of them with a, you know, again, sort of a, I don't know, sled, what would you call that? A slide to get the yeah. logs up on the hill and put re reassemble the cabin. A lot of cabins were moved around up here um, after the 1964 Wilderness Act. And then again, some were even bought and sold again after the 1978 Act. And of course, traveling in the winter on ice was easier than the roads in the summer. Here's another, I, I love these pictures. Here's Oler and Jerome Brandt with a brand new boat on Oler's truck. Someone told me that that truck's still around in the county someplace. Um, but isn't that a great photo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, get some new boats. So let me talk a little bit about my parents. They were married, uh, they fell in love, the fishing worked, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. They dated for a couple of years and then got married at Hovland in Trinity Lutheran Church. Um, it was winter, February 13th. They were gonna honeymoon at the cabin. Dad forgot the snowshoes. <laughs> so they had to hike that four miles through deep snow and what a way to start a marriage, huh? <laughs> anyway, uh, I only found this one photo of Cal Rutstrom. It's really dark and hard to see. I, I never knew him my, myself. 
but he owned the land that both uh, Cliff Waters and my dad bought. And, and then more recently, my dad told me they actually leased it to prove up to Cal that they could run the business. So um, those early years, they leased and then purchased the land of just, just under 10 acres um, to start with the Wilderness Canoe Outfitters. Um, here's a little bit better picture of the building. I think I've got one more, but basically the left side was the office. The right side was our home. It was just me and mom and dad at that time. It was one room with kind of a pull-out couch and a few shelves and office had a desk and some shelves. So all the camping gear was on those shelves. There I am at pretty young age. And so now this is Trails and Cafe. They've moved it to join it with the store and it's the cafe building. Um, some early clients. Uh, so they started 56, 57, 58. Um, and so he's holding the paddle with the way of the wilderness on the paddle. Some of the early gear, uh, Mick McBride and Martin Wandry were longtime friends of dad's. Got some new canoes, Grumman's from Duluth. Started with three, added more. I think when dad sold the business, there were 25. He always wanted to keep the business kind of one man operation. So I worked down the road for Tuscarora in ninth and 10th grade. He had 250 canoes, dad had 25 canoes. So 10 times the size. Um, so, you know, just different kinds of operations. And then early towing. It was, it's done a little different today, but I got a kick out of this. He did tow, you know, tow people down the lakes occasionally. And then decided that little building was a little too small, so cleared some land. And um, he bought this Quonset hut for 10 bucks, moved it. Uh, it was down by uh, somewhere along where the Banadad Trail is. And moved it up here, promised mom they'd only live in it one year. But yeah, Stuart laughs. laughs. It was more like 10 years. Uh, no bathroom. You know, there's an outhouse up the hill. Again, the water pipe in the summer came up from the lake um, and carried water in the winter. And I, there was a little oil furnace in it or a stove. And mom would always keep a tea kettle on that in the winter because you had to take the tea kettle outside, unthaw the gas line to get the kitchen stove. <laughs> running when it, was, when it was, you know, 20 below or whatever. Let's see what else do I have there. Uh, we had two, just two bedrooms on the, on the back side. And when it was like this, there was ice on the inside too. Mm -hmm. So here's the outfitting building. Um, George Monquist, a longtime family friend, designed it. And it had an office on the far side, shower houses on this side, which are a huge improvement over an outhouse in the lake. And mm -hmm. then up on the top, there were two lofts, which were sort of supposed to be guides quarters or whatever, but our family really, one, one, one end was the boys dorm and the other side was the girls dorm. Had a kitchen in it where I got to spend a lot of hours scrubbing cook kits and Stuart was the canoe washer there. So here it is. It's been moved today um, over to the side. So you can't look down the road to see it, but it's uh, the building is essentially the same. Now, I, I probably should have recorded this uh, from my dad, but he wanted to use a bear paw as a logo. And he did actually use a um, literally a bear's paw, a hind paw print to make the logo. And then when Bear Track Outfitters opened in town, he was really mad at Dave Williams. <laughs> but they had a friendly agreement finally that Dave would use the front paw, Dad was con would continue to use the back paw, and people would somehow know the difference between the two outfitters. <laughs> Always a friendly rivalry. So here's some early canoe parties. They've been in business three or four years here. So this is leaving from the Seagull Landing near the campground, leaving from Gull Lake. And then uh, I'm a little young here, but later in my life, uh, you know, mom washed all those sleeping bag liners. I mean, again, technology's changed today, but those were kind of the, uh, um, you know, cotton sleeping bags and they had a flannel liner. You had to remove that and wash that. She had a ringer washer. And then I got to pin them on the clothesline and use that a big long 
wooden thing to prop up the clotheslines to keep them all out of the dirt so they dry in the wind. Oh, I'm sorry these are so small. I wasn't sure how these would look, but I did go through our photo albums and picked a few. So this is at Gull Lake at the campground hill um, in the early years. And I should, I should ask the experts in the room, when was the campground built or opened? Anybody know? It opened in about 1965. Okay. So I think these say these say 1962. So this would have been pre-campground then, but clearly the landing is very busy. It says May, so I'm guessing this might be fishing opener. There's a lot of cars there. And that too looks different because it's all grown up today. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we always begged uh, dad to take us to the landing to go swimming because the bay that we lived on uh, behind way of the wilderness was mucky like five feet of muck mm -hmm. and he'd throw a little sand down there but it really didn't do much so this rock and this part of gull lake was a favorite swimming spot for all of us as was also seagull i'm up on the rocks on the right and then mom was the one who took me fishing when i was little she put uh, Stuart and stanton uh to bed in the evening and then we'd go down to the seagull river and she'd just cut a little willow switch and we'd haul our fish back so an early picture of all our family uh mom and dad in the back Stuart on the left stanton's got his head down there uh susan on mom's lap and i'm holding sally so this would have been what 1967 yeah and then another one a little bit later susan on the left sally's on my lap Stuart's in the back with mom and Stanton loved his coat. <laughs> and then dad, I'm not sure if this is right around the time he sold it or it might have been later. It still has their name on the sign though. So I think it's about the time he sold the business in 1976 to uh, Bud Darling. Of course, now they've had that, you know, like 45 years or so, so longer. I mentioned that um, dad was uh, in a book. And so Bill Sanderson was one of dad's employees. He only had a couple employees in, over the years. And Bill and his cousin were there one summer or part of the summer, most of the summer. So Bill really wanted to write these stories about dad. And so he finally did publish this book. I don't know if it's is it still around, still available um, and kind of pro promotes the importance of wilderness and getting the wilderness in you apparently was a saying that my dad told um, Bill and Bill brought many, many people up here to be outfitted at Way of the Wilderness and kind of continued that relationship. So I don't know if these are the right transition slides, but uh, to talk a little bit about uh, my influences, um, you know, grew up in canoe country and so I didn't, our family, you don't, when you have a business, you don't really get time off in the summer. So we didn't really take canoe trips. Um, but I did a few with uh, both Stuart and I did a few with uh, camps. And then somehow I talked my folks into letting me go on this five day tri trip on Seagull Lake with my friend Kathy. And I was, I think, in uh, seventh grade. So that's pretty young to be out on your own for a uh, But we had a great time. And um, I did not know how to read a map because when you went to the cabin, you knew where to go. When you went to Farriers or uh, Canadian, you know, you knew where to go. And that's all I had ever known about. Like I, we had maps in the office and Stuart and I used to always play games about, you know, can you find such and such a lake? So we knew them as a piece of paper, but we didn't know how to translate that into the country. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, a friend sent me this. I borrowed some pictures um, from Karen O'Leary. Um, and so she had this uh, shot of me going up the stairway portage. Um, I loved carrying the canoe. I didn't, I hated carrying packs, but Stuart and I both did a couple trips through Voyager's Landing, no longer there, but that was mid trail on Bearskin, between Bearskin and Hungry Jack. I did a 16 day trip starting at Shabandawan, coming down through Quetico to Sag and another one going kind of down the Granite River and around. And then uh, what later out of high school, I pulled together our women's trip. We wanted to do Hunter's Island, but the fishing was too good and the days are really short in October. 
we worked all summer, so you could only go when you got laid off in the fall. And, um, and uh, so we only made it, we did a short trip through Canopy and back, a 10 day fall trip. And then uh, bringing in the Seagull Guard Station piece. So this is an aerial view by my friend, Karen. Uh, again, another place that looks a little different today after a uh, ham lake fire. Um, and she took this um, on a fire. You can see the helipad down there in the middle right. And there's one of my heroes, Russ. I told him you're going to be the in the shot. Um, so when I was a kid, um, Russ and Craig Sturm and Carbine or Ronnie Carlson, they all worked at the guard station. They were like heroes to me. You know, they knew Smokey Bear, <laughs> right? Right. And uh, they just had these cool jobs. And so um, later on, I, I didn't want to be a waitress in Graham Ray. And so I took a civil service exam and, and started writing permits in the Forest Service office in Graham Ray. And that was fun. It, it wasn't waitressing. I liked that part. But after a couple of years of doing that, I wanted, I was like, I want to go out and do what the guys are doing. And so Russ was an early believer in me and convinced me that I could do it. And so I was hired with a kind of a cadre of women. I think there were seven of us hired that summer. Ely had had women wilderness rangers before that, but Gunflint, we were a group uh, of the first women wilderness rangers. Um, I worked up here on Seagull and Sag in 79 and 80, which were the two years after Public Line 95 495 was passed, which meant new motor restrictions, you know, um, changes in the boundaries, and you know, you could have a 25 horse, you could have a 40 horse through, but people didn't know, you know, the implementation of all these rules. And so it was a very interesting uh, year to be working um, in the area. And, I always told people kind of the snapshot of what I did. I had 25 miles of trail and portage. That included 12 miles of the Kekakotic Trail. So, you know, a lot of that was trail and not, not as many portages because the lakes are so close together up here, unlike some other parts of the Bond Waters. 205 campsites. Um, and another one of the great jobs I had. Uh, really loved it. My friend Karen uh, was at the guard station. She was a fire guard and worked in the campgrounds when there weren't fires. But uh, my roommate, uh, which I'll, or my uh, partner, uh, Nancy, didn't like to camp. And we were supposed to be, we did, had, did, we did a lot of day trips on Seagull and Sag, but when you go to a gish or down the Granite River, you gotta go overnight. And so Karen would trade with Nancy because Karen liked going out with me. And Nancy, who didn't like to camp, could go back to the guard station every night. And then um, I don't know if any, do any of you know Todd Hay? Yes. Okay, that's Todd in the front of the boat. He worked on our crew that summer. Yes. He was a young kid. Well, he's, I thought of him as young then. He's maybe like three years younger than me, but he was really tall, so he could get down to the bottom of the latrine hole and throw the, <laughs> throw the gravel on it. So he was kind of the new kid, new kid on the uh, new kid on the crew. And so you know, when we were digging new latrine holes, he was the one we'd send down because he was tall enough to get it all out. Anyway, Todd recently bought a cabin on Seagull Lake. He's right next to me. Yeah. Right next to you. Yeah. So I haven't seen him yet, except on Facebook. But yeah, he worked with our crew in probably either 79 or 80, whatever year. Must have been 80. And then there's Karen and I. We kept our boats uh, by Fred Zoff's place. It mm -hmm. saved putting the boat in and out of the landings every day. And we also kept the Seagull boat over here at Seagull uh, Outfitters. Oops, wrong way. And then, um, Jim organized a women's retreat at Wilderness Canoe Base. So here's some of the women that were both on wilderness crews and uh, at this women's retreat. So Mary Igo, she worked in the office, but I actually convinced her to come out with me a few times when my partner didn't want to go camping. And so she went down the Granite River with me and other things. I'm not sure who the woman in black in back is, the, the, the um, black woman, but Katie Kukinen is uh, next. And then Cheryl Larson on the right. You might know her from town. She still lives in Graham Ray. Ginny in the front, can't remember her last name. And then Nancy Game on the lower right. 
um, was my partner and she's, she and Karen O'Leary, Karen uh, retired from the Forest Service, so worked her whole career for the Forest Service. Nancy also worked for the Forest Service on the Chugach National Forest in Alaska, so Nancy and Karen knew each other. And then we recently connected back up again. So kind of common grounds, common likes. And so then at that women's retreat, here's this uh, little bit foggy, but great picture of my mom, Gail Scrine, Justine Kerfoot, and Eve Blankenberg kind of looking through some photo albums. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this is where Jim got the maps out. And I know he was doing some recording during those gatherings. So that was a lot of fun. Another early, early influencer, um, Ken and Nat Rusk, uh, I knew all my life, and they Artist used to. David. Yeah, Artist Dave. I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Artist is on the right. Uh, Nat is not in this photo, and I maybe should have cut it. But uh, Artist was a good friend of my mom's, but I didn't know her that well. But Ken and Nat uh, took me to Isle Royal when I was in fourth grade, and that was kind of one of my first big ventures out of the county was to go to Isle Royal and it was camping uh, in the Adirondack shelters and they also gave me a book called uh, Travels with Charlie and so that adventure side kind of came out. Here's Karen and Pat. Uh, Pat worked up here before I did and then was working somewhere else when I started and then came back and he and Karen met at Seagull, got married at Seagull and now they own a couple of places up here and are forever tied and I'm glad they own a place here because it means they come back to Minnesota a couple of times every year or yeah every year and then I just wanted to end with this idea that people do gather together um, and this I think Nat is on the lower left so I do have a little picture there of Nat but um, people come together at places like this and, and share stories and um, share hard work you know cutting brush or burn piles or planting trees or, you know, whatever it is. Um, it's a good place to live because people know their neighbors mm -hmm. and are comfortable getting together. And so back to that canoe trip when I was a kid, um, this was uh, a favorite picture of my dad's and someone painted this painting. And he had this painting up in the back of the outfitting building up above the door. And so I'm paddling down Seagull Lake. We've got this map. We have no idea where we are. Paddling and paddling. And we camped kind of up, um, not, not too far away from the landing the first night. I think it was actually outside the boundary waters, but we're paddling, paddling. And we come on this scene. And I'm like, I know that. That's your tail point. I look at the map. There's your tail point. And all of a sudden, it all sort of came together. And I figured out how to read a map after that because I, I just didn't understand the uh, distance on a map, you know. So anyway, I love this uh, picture again. Another place that doesn't look the same today, but at that time it was an iconic place um, on the lake. And I think uh, that's the end. We certainly have time for questions and comments. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I don't know. If people have questions, I don't know what I can answer, but I can try. I think sometime you should invite um, uh, Karen and Pat O'Leary. She she yes. did send me a few of these slides, but she's she's got more. They're not really public speaking type, but they have a lot of stories to share and. Russ and his family have a lot of stories to share. If you don't have them on your list, um, they'd be some, they, they, they have some, I, I just have some fabulous memories. I got to tell one. Okay, so <laughs> Russ has a younger sister who, Robin, who's just a year older than I was. And they were here at Seagull for a number of years. But when I was I don't know, upper elementary school, I would beg, please, dad, please take me down to Seagull to see Robin. It was my closest friend. There was no one else. Um, uh, Barb Waters was quite a few years older than I was, lived up on the hill from us. Uh, Susie Denham uh, lived, um, let's see, where did they live? On Sag Point but she was quite a few years older than I was. They rode the bus with me, so I knew them from the bus, but 
they weren't really playmates. I mean, they were, you know, off doing completely different things. So Robin was really the closest friend I have. And, and when you, you can't walk four miles, well, you probably could walk four miles, but we didn't back then. And we didn't really have bicycles or anything. So she was always begging. We were always begging rides back and forth. Could she come up or could I go down? And so, um, you know, spent, uh, spent time with her. But my other, my other friends were really the campground people. So my family's here because we're all going camping for a couple of days at Trails End. And, you know, I'm sure it's still true today, but people would come for a week and they'd pick the same campsite the same week every year or sometimes two weeks. And so the people that would come from Iowa or Southern Minnesota or wherever, the ones that had kids, we all got to know them really well because there were no other neighbor kids around. And so we played with those kids. And uh, I recently uh, got to meet um, Lori Cotton Dupre, Dupass, something like that. Uh, they're over on Gull Lake and they used to come camping. Their family all had kids our age and we stayed, you know, buddies all through these years. They bought a cabin, it got burned down in Ham Lake, they rebuilt it. Um, so there's some, you know, just sort of long uh, acquaintances became long time friendships, I guess. I think I saw a hand over here. Hi, I'm Lady Hedstrom. Um, I have a lot of memories of your mom and dad. And I'm of your dad. In the one time we always built a cabin. Now I can remember the guys out there working, and it seemed cold, but it was hot because the sun was shining. And my dad would give me a hammer and some nails and, and a board, and I just hammer away with the rest of them. And uh, your mom, I think your mom, took me to my first day of school in first grade in Gary Oh, wow. And my mom was, and dad was too busy to go. So sure. Your mom I know she was really fond of you guys. Oh, yeah. And you stayed in touch. I didn't like you because I was really bratty. Any other questions? I saw another hand back there. Oh. <laughs> Maybe it was an admission. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was thinking that picture of your mom carrying water up from the lake uh, was probably the winter that you stayed in our house. That could be. Yeah. yeah, I think we we stayed there when I was just a year or so old. Did your parents leave for the winter or something that year? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes, we used to go to Arizona in the wintertime. So we kept our house warm all, all winter. Yeah, so that was a few years after they worked there, but they went back to stay in the house. And I the one of the things that you know felt like the full circle with that is when End of the Trail Lodge sold to the government after the 1978 act, um, it was, I don't remember the year, it must have been 83 or 84, somewhere in there. They had so many years after the 78 act to, to sell if they chose to. And so then all the, go the government had all these buildings over there. They had a whole resort with all the cabins and um, didn't really have a plan yet because it was gonna be a while before they could put them all up for sale. So. I don't know if I asked or if they asked me or how it happened, but I care took. So I stayed in that same house that whole winter by myself, me and my dog, uh, that whole winter, um, we got to live in the same house they had when I was a year old. So that was kind of a fun. I don't remember. We had running water in the winter. Oh, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Anything else? Thank well, let's you. thank Sandy for just a really seminal afternoon. Yeah. There are some treats and some coffee, lemonade, and water in back. If any of you would like to have some, you're more than welcome to. And again, we have a sign-up sheet for anybody that likes to bake or volunteer for the pie social. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>